Welcome to PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. Blair, another four fantastic European fixtures for us to enjoy this week, which means we are back with the European show. But before we discuss all of the fantastic football that was played this week, tell us what you're wearing. Again, a little bit more unusual as I like to go these days. This is in 1996, one year after I was born. PSV away top, just after the original Ronaldo had left. Um, one by the likes of Yap Stam, Arthur Newman, Dennis Romadal, a period during the 90s when it seems to be Holland had all the best kits. It was Ajax kits, Feyenoord shirts, the PSV shirts. It's one of my favourites. And what about that for yourself? Yeah, before we discuss this, Phillips, the sponsor in PSV, just seems like I can't think of a PSV shirt without having the Philips sponsor. Do you yeah, know? so they, they you, you do get so AC Milan um, and Real Madrid for years. It was the, the one or, or B one before that kind of yeah. era. I always think of like you know shirt sponsors or, or yeah. with eras, but PSV seems like it's just been Philips the, the entire time. Well, Philips were intrinsically linked with PSV for a long time. They actually they had the name and state name rights of the stadium and were linked with the actual hierarchy of the stadium. So they were actually a part of the club, and that was like that way for a lot of um, years. I think it was 20, 30 years until they eventually changed. Maybe about ten years ago. Yeah. Well, this one, 2005, 2006, third shirt of Real Madrid. A very fetching silver colour, I might yeah, add. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's. Um, yeah, you don't see many silver no. or can we, we can't call it grey. No, no, no it's definitely, it's definitely, def definitely shimmering in the light there. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, some of the amazing players that uh, that played that season. You know, the original Ronaldo, David Beckham, Roberto Carlos. Yeah, the it, squad that year was stacked. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was the Galacticos. But if anyone's watched the David Beckham documentary, the 05 06 season, they were absolutely rubbish. Yeah, they won nothing, <laughs> but not a bad five or side team. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Anyway, let's take a look at the results from this week's. UEFA Champions League, we can bring those on screen for you just now. So we kicked the week off on Tuesday, PSV and Dortmund, one all draw, 1-0 one win for Inter Milan against Atletico Madrid. Yesterday, Porto beat Arsenal, 1-0 last minute winner there, we'll get into that. And of course, a one all draw between Napoli and Barcelona at the Diego Armando Maradona Stadium. But let's start with uh, Arsenal and Porto. Uh, game fresh in your memory from last night, an important one for, for, from Porto. Yeah, Porto at home, but uh, what about that goal? I mean, it was an absolute cracker. A, a cracker of a goal and less than a cracker of a game, I'll be honest. Not not really up to the massive standards that we place on these Champions League nights, but a, a worthy winner and the last kick of the ball as well. I mean, that's always a killer for any team can see in the 95th minute. I've seen a video there posted of Rio Ferdinand's reaction to the goal right on the sideline. He is he is losing his mind. He's going crazy at that result. Um, did, but, you see the, did you see the video of him on the, on the airplane? So he was, he was flying out, um, him and Ali McCoy were flying out to do the game, and they were on a flight full of Arsenal fans, and he's getting dogs abuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Ferdinand picks up like the, I don't know, the, the intercom or, or the tannoy or whatever, um, that the captain uses to speak, to speak to the plane and just absolutely piles back yeah, in. Yeah, his, his I think problem. he would have enjoyed that goal yeah, even yeah, more definitely. so then. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, an absolute, it was an absolute great goal to win at Arsenal. I did tip them back before Christmas to say that they might have a good run in this competition they were maybe my shock outsiders to go far well, I've gone Bayern Munich so <laughs> yeah, yeah the less said about predictions the better yeah. I mean it's it's no way over for Arsenal it's a 1-0 loss um, away goal rules obviously not in, not in play anymore so not getting that away goal isn't the, as detrimental as it used to be um, but losing a goal like that in the very last minute and I mean I think Mikel Arteta will talk about it he said that if you can't win a game like this it's vital that you don't lose it Kind of win it, you don't lose it. Um, we really dominated the game, but we lacked purpose, especially in the first half, to, to have much more aggression, to break lines, to play forward, to to generate much more threat in the back line. In the second half, there were better, much better things, and we generated a lot of situations without really creating much from it. But uh, we will learn from it. Now it's clear, it's half time. Uh, you want to be in quarterfinals. You have to be your opponent. It's clear, uh, and that will be the purpose and the plan uh, with all our supporters together to to do it. And yeah, I think it's clear what you're saying there that losing a goal that late on, it's it's almost more damaging mentally because you're so close to getting the nil nil result, digging in away from home, setting up. But Arsenal are by far and away not out of it, and I still fancy them back at the end. Of yeah, just a quick little point, and we don't want to get too sidetracked, but you were talking about. Um, the no away goal rule now it's, it seems to be like a kind of post COVID thing that's happening in football similar to five subs things that have just stayed what do you think of it? Do I you mean, bring it back? 
I can see the, the benefits of both sides, to be honest. I don't want to sit on the fence, but I've I seen a lot of people this week saying that they would prefer it back just because it was, I think it was Arsenal, Bayern Munich and Atleti all had zero shots on target, all away teams this week. And is it is it a case that these away teams are now scared to attack or they don't feel the, they don't feel the need to attack as much and they, they can sit in and go, OK, it's, particularly if it's a sort of so-called bigger team going away from home going, I'll take a 1-0 loss, I'll take a 0-0, take it back home and do the business at home? Yeah, it's, I'm torn on this because I think um, away goal makes the first leg better. I think that, that makes the first leg more exciting. But then I just think it just makes the home leg, like, teams then just go and sit in on the home leg if, if they've scored one goal or, or if they've yeah. managed to get two away goals. So I think when you're watching when, when you're watching second legs, as a kid, I always wanted the game to go extra time. Like, yeah. I always just I think it was because Champions League games were always on a school night and you wanted to, you know, stay yeah, up later yeah, and yeah, go to yeah. extra time. You get, you get to watch it. But even now, as a neutral, you want games to go to extra time. Not if you're at the game working. No, no chance. But no. <laughs> I, I think there definitely is a two and a, a four and against yeah. it, though. I, I think there always was a little bit of feeling unjustly beaten if you're, mm. if you're a team you're a fan of a team who perhaps draw one each and then draw two each and you're not technically beaten over two legs but you are beaten on away goals you know so there is there is maybe a little bit of that but um, yeah but I, I think I'd keep it out keep it yes, out keep it out okay that's your opinion see what the people out there think um, talking about that goal to, brought me thinking about some last minute winners um, some late goals in the Champions League some of my favourites Sergio Roberto is the one that always comes back to that's me. your number one that's my number one yeah. it's got to be it's got to be for Barcelona really? and that comeback against PSG I remember watching that game in a pub in the middle of Glasgow nonetheless and PSG against Barcelona you think there's not a lot of support for that game I've seen this bar go crazy at that goal <laughs> as if we were in downtown Barcelona people throwing their pints in the air going what an incredible comeback that was yeah I love the the Lucas Mona versus Ajax and yeah. um, do you know what I didn't love it at the time I want I wanted that Ajax team to get to the yeah, final yeah, yeah. you know football hipsters like like ourselves love Ajax everybody and, wanted yeah, Ajax Barcelona and that Troy final know, everybody but, yeah. but like that iconic image of Lucas Mora running away with the, the Ajax players like it's, uh, Dilek and, a, and another few players Lying on the floor, distraught. Yeah. It's the kind of aerial shot. Oh, it's, it's, it's totally heartbreaking conceding a goal that late. It's been, I don't think it's any more heartbreaking than Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, yeah. 1999, the final for Manchester United against Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich, they must think they have that sewn up. And then up pops Solskjaer with the second of the goals um, in deep in injury time to secure the full competition. Not even a, a playoff game, not even a semi final, <laughs> a quarter final, but the final. Yeah. That must be the sorest of all. Heartbreaking. We can't talk about last minute winners without talking about Torres versus Bayern. Barca and of yeah, course the yeah. Gary Neville yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yep, that's, one. That's, that's where it comes from yeah was that um, the first Gary Neville Ooh. I, I think so I think that's where it originally came from and I yeah. think that's uh, the, the kind of game that secured Torres' reputation amongst Chelsea fans um, after what was quite a difficult period there um, and speaking of number nines that was the tail of the tape against Napoli and Barcelona where it was Robert Lewandowski scored for Barcelona and Victor Osimhen scored for Napoli and I think it was almost quite it was symbolic as a bit of a changing of the guard in terms of like European forwards. Robert Lewandowski, I think he's been the man, he's been untouchable as a number nine in terms of European football. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to see this new wave of obviously Haaland, the now Aussie man coming in, as going to take, potentially take his crown as you are the centre forward that everybody wants. Yeah, it seems like he's going to move this summer. It's it's got it, to be. Ev everyone's talking, although, much as I love Aussie men for... For Napoli, I thought he was rubbish in the African Cup of Nations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought he was quite poor, actually. We're getting sidetracked. PSV Dortmund, 1-0 player. Yep, yep. Um, not a bad game. I, wa I watched a good bit of this. I thought it was quite an interesting game. Two teams that are maybe on paper, you would say that Dortmund are maybe more likely to go through. But I think, I think PSV have definitely got something about them this year. They've got a team full of guys who really, really seems like they've got something to prove. I mean, none more so than their boss, Peter Bosch, who was at Dortmund before. Now came in and said, this PSV is the best team that he's ever worked with after an unsuccessful period oh. at Dortmund. You've yeah. got guys like Herring, Chucky Lozano, he was at Napoli, um, the Mexican international, he's now back, still only 28 years old, he's a player that really was tipped for big things and never really achieved them, but now obviously turned it on at PSV and again, none more so than Luke de Jong, the man who's their centre forward, um, will be remembered for a 
a relatively unsuccessful period at Newcastle. Um, the same with Barcelona. He played really well with Sevilla, don't get me wrong, where he won the Europa League um, in 2020. But he is a player that I think got a lot of unjust criticism over the years. He was once named at 75 in a list of the 100 top worst strikers in the Premier League. Which I thought was really unfair. This is a guy who... That's he, brutal, isn't he, it? Yes. He holds an incredible record. He Whoa. scored 77 goals with his head. That's the, that's the highest in any of Europe's top league, six leagues. Wow. Over the same period, which you're not a bad player if you can do that. No, no, that's incredible. Um, just when you were speaking about Peter Bosch there, he will, we interviewed him when he was here playing Rangers in the in yep, the, and the, the playoff in the Champions League. Really yep. impressive. I yep. think he, oh, I really liked him. You know, you quite often have managers that are quite dismissive of the Scottish game when, when they come over for um, for European games. But P Peter Bosch and Luke De Jong, who was also also speaking that day, I thought I thought they were you know really nice guys and. Uh, came across really, really well. Um, yep. Yes, My, he was up against his old team. Yes, yes, he was at Dortmund for a while. Bit of a Largely, theme, bit of a theme of that. that you were yes, say, yes, yeah. and it does seem to be a bit of a theme of the week. And carrying that on into our final game of the week, Inter Milan won Atletico Madrid nil. Mm. Did you catch that game? Yes, yes, I did. Um, Marco Arnautovic. Uh, scored in the only goal of the game but he should have had about another 25 goals yes <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, he did miss a couple of chances I mean until they, they seem to dominate this game but I think a 1-0 is probably probably fair enough on the balance of things Simone and Zaggy's in this year they're flying I'll stop you there do you know what really wound me up the amount of people that assumed that he was the same in Zaggy that played for AC Milan yeah people <laughs> that it's all over Twitter and it's like it's, this is a completely different guy <laughs> yeah. he's, he's a well known manager yeah <laughs> sorry um, I had to get that in there no not at all um, Simone and Zaggy a good player in his own right um they, they are flying this year and almost going a little bit under the radar. They are top of Serie A. They have scored 59 goals, um, which is the highest across Europe's top five divisions, and also conceded the fewest goals in Europe's top five divisions as well. Um, Inter Milan really, obviously, Champions League final last year, they were unlucky in the final, came up against that juggernaut of Manchester City. But they seem to be going along and they could be a, a bit of an outside pick to get really far in the competition this year. Yeah, Marco Arnautovic, as we were, we were just speaking about him. Yeah. Um, but I really... Strange career, impressive career nonetheless. He's been a fantastic player for for a number of years. But I think you wanted to discuss his time, um, his first spell. At yep. Milan, something so. that you didn't know when I brought it to you. Yeah, earlier, I actually did didn't actually even know that he played for Inter, play Milan, for Inter yeah, Milan. Yeah, and it was easy to miss. He did only play three games first time round. Um, he came in in two thousand and ten. Um, this was the summer before Inter Milan won the Champions League. Um, when Jose Mourinho was manager, Jose Mourinho was um, on so the was, it, was this the what, summer of 09 or? Yes, summer of, uh, summer of 09 going, 09, in, going, going in, 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 in the 09 10 season. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and Jose Nino was manager, just won the Scudetto with uh, Inter Milan, and he comes away with this brilliant story about the, the confidence, shall we say, of a young Arnautovic when he says he was at Inter Milan, and Arnautovic arrived on loan from FC20, I think he was the age 18, and he says, uh, My strikers at the time, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Adriano, Hernan Crespo, Julio Cruz, not bad. Not, not a bad forward line if you had to pick <laughs> Incredible, them out. yeah. And he says, Marco Arnautovic, first thing he does, first day of training, he walks over to Jose Mourinho, shakes his hand. Now, bear in mind, this is a team that had just won Serie A. And he says, I'm better than every one of them you've got. <laughs> that reminds me of what you would do at training if you turned <laughs> up to him on. <laughs> um, not at all, not. <laughs> and I, I, I think it just shows the mark of the man and how he, kinda, how he went through his whole career. Um, do you know what, that is like... Ibrahimovic-esque yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's what he was trying to tout himself yeah, as yeah, in, yeah. A, in a younger year and I mean the, the season afterwards that was the famous season that Milan went on to lift oh. the European Cup and I mean what a team they had Julio Cesar Zanetti Lucio Samuel Kivu Thiago Mota Wesley Schneider when he should have famously should have won the Ballon d'Or that year Esteban Cambiasso Samuel Eto'o Diego Melito Goran Pandev an incredible start in 11, a really iconic start in 11 of the last 20 years. Um, and Marko Anatovic, he didn't manage to play um, many minutes in that Champions League campaign, but as it's famously told by a German journalist, he went to Werder Bremen the next season and had Champions League winner engraved <laughs> and stitched onto his boots. And you've just you've got to love that confidence. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Do, do, do you know what? I can see a bit of that. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't mind, you know, like you're having a bit of that. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind that at all. I think I think that shows personality. Yeah, I think it's like um, 
Scottish, like I, I do this all the time. Always like refer to Billy Gilmore as a Champions League winner. Yeah, <laughs> played, a few, played a few group games. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's like, and I mean, he's a Champions League winner, but he's more of a Champions League winner yeah. than Arnautovic. But testament, testament to Arnautovic, he's still playing at the highest level. Yeah. He's still scoring goals in the Champions League. He just came off two seasons at Bologna, um, two two of his best seasons of his career at Bologna, where he hit double figures in two years. So he's obviously still got something there. I think he's probably gained a little bit of humility in his later years, but. A player that's had an incredible career, nonetheless. Yeah, so he's returned to, to Inter Milan, but there were quite a few players you would like to, to speak yep. about. Um, some examples of players who have left and come back. In so it is very much a running theme of this week. We've had Luke de Jong, yes. we've had Peter Bosch, we've had Pepe, who was at Porto, and now back to Porto again. Still stringing together results in the Champions League, Marto Arnautovic. And it got me thinking about players who, particularly in the Champions League, have starred for the club and then went back. The first one that comes to mind, Daily Blind of Ajax. He was first at Ajax before he went off to Manchester United. And largely, I think everyone that was at at Manchester United during that period didn't have the best time of it. He done okay, though. He he, he done okay. I think he he held his... um, he was, had a respectable career in England, yeah. went back to Ajax, and he was part of that team that we were talking about earlier that um, were beaten by Tottenham in the, the semi-final. Um, and I think him, between him and obviously his dad, Danny Blind, who won the Champions League with Ajax in 1995, um, he's a name synonymous for that club and will forever be a legend. Another one, Mario Goetze, who famously, I was, I was doing a lot of research into this, in the 2013 final, um, he left... Borussia Dortmund for Bayern Munich and they were to, set to meet in that final at Wembley in June and in the May he announced I'm going to be joining Bayern Munich in the summer uh, which is uh, crazy to say the least but also pretty brave saying that you're going to go <laughs> to the team that um, you're playing in the Champions League final he missed that Champions League final with a hamstring injury um, mysterious yes um, he did return to Dortmund three years later um, and he did he's on record saying that he regrets that move to Bayern Munich so if he'd have stayed at Dortmund who's to say what he could have achieved of course he did score the winning goal in a World Cup final but he had not a bad career I th- yeah I no. feel like he's just one of so many players who just kind of slipped away yeah such a promising start to their career everyone was raving about them and you know he has got uh, a world a world cup to his name you yeah. know what I mean? so yeah this is a an amazing football of an amazing career but you always just feel like what could it be maybe made that big yeah. move just at the wrong time maybe a few more years at Dortmund we'd see where it ended up Sergio Ramos of course now back at Sevilla playing the Champions League this season mm. after a career at Real Madrid and PSG interesting one Ian Robin who actually went back to his hometown yes, club right. of Groningen so he retired he obviously scored the winner in the 2013 aforementioned 2013 Champions League final he retired in 2019 He's like, that's me, hanging up my boots, I'm done. A year later, he comes back out of retirement to sign for his hometown club of Groningen. Um, I think that was partly to help through the COVID pandemic. I think that was just partly to have a sort of swan song. Didn't have the best of times of it and maybe shows that you shouldn't always go back. It isn't always getting here on the other side. Made only six appearances. It was limited due to injury. But again, I don't think anyone will say a bad word about him there. And my favourite, save to last, Claudio Pizarro. Claudio Pizarro, you know I love centre forwards on this show, Adam. Um, Claudio Pizarro. Pizarro was a veteran striker. He seemed to be a veteran his whole career, despite <laughs> um, um, playing at so many different clubs. And he just loved playing for Werder Bremen. Now, he went to them a sensational, no less than five different times. He went elsewhere and he was always drawn back to Werder Bremen. He went to Bayern Munich, he went to Chelsea, he went to Bayern Munich twice, actually. A man who obviously feels quite at home in Germany. Um, and yet he's a, he's a legend at that club, scoring 153 goals and 320 appearances. He is a second all-time goal scorer and a name synonymous with that game. Just five times even. as like one of those ones where your pal keeps going back to the, yeah, to the next message. Yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. come on, mate, not again. Yeah, like, it's just yeah. going to end like it did last time. But... He just can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> just... but I think he's a legend in the Verde Bremen fans' hearts. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure there, are, there will be plenty of examples of players who have left the club, come back, maybe did a great job, maybe a not so good job. So make sure to let us know in the comment section below if we have missed anyone out and we may revisit it in a future show. But unfortunately, Blair, that's all for this week. Thank you for your company. Make sure to stay tuned with everything going on across Scottish football, English football and European football across all of PLZ Soccer's social media platforms.